What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you episode 212 of Block Digest at block height 622,326, Friday, March 20th. Um, currently on the verge in the U.S., at least, of moving into martial law. So, what's up, guys? Isn't Oof. it the cyberpunk dream you always wanted? No, not really. Well, yeah, it's coming. I mean, for sure, it's hard to believe it's been a week honestly it's like uh just thinking like what's better friday than last friday as far as uh the market story is right now with but uh as far as details and yeah things are starting to get kind of locked down and things are getting a lot more serious and uh you know cyberpunk is uh definitely gonna get thrust in the forefront of all this I'm on week three now of uh not leaving my apartment and when I say that I haven't left my apartment I have gone out on the balcony and I have gone outside to take out the trash and to a nearby park because there's a lot of space here. But yeah, I haven't left in three weeks now. Good God, I'm on day eight and I'm already like I've been outside for a couple of hours and eight days and yeah, it's starting to be legitimately weird. I mean I've had a couple of meetups now in remote and I'm already thinking about like I'm gonna go for a walk uh, again this weekend at some point. I gotta do something to get outside, but uh, definitely gonna be using precautions. I haven't noticed a difference. Like it's 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 I don't know. I'm staring at a computer screen all day. That's a change. <laughs> well, you need what to... I find what I find absolutely hilarious is that I've now started to see a lot of the like major youtubers starting to post their quote quarantine videos and it's hilarious because i'm i haven't seen a single one who actually has it or thinks they have it so they're calling it quarantine when it should be like isolation or social distancing and it's hilarious because a lot of them they go for like three or four days and they can't take it anymore and they go outside and that is after like they've had friends over to their house and they're like yeah we're social distancing and they're drinking out of the same mugs and all of this shit and it's like you people are all pathetic <laughs> like <laughs> but the, i swear there's going to be a huge surge in youtubers posting their quarantine videos it's going to become a new topic yeah, I think that everybody's going to have to uh, learn the hard way how to balance that right with uh, just finding social connection and avoiding the cringe of I am now the Instagram person showing you what they're eating every five minutes that I constantly talk shit about six months ago. How to make rice and beans look appetizing after <laughs> after 60 days of eating it. I can't tell you how many home workout videos I've already seen posted where everybody's like, this is how you do the home workout, and here's what you should be eating. And, yeah, it's going to slowly – I mean, like, hey, I hope that, you know, we get these videos and people start taking care of their self, P's and Q's, and in a couple of weeks it'll be, you know, the trend and we're all back up. But I don't know. It could get disturbing, man. You start seeing some of these YouTube stars saying, like, hey, this is day one with the corona and we're following them and – suddenly their videos just stop uploading and i'm just like i'm worried about what i think the government's worried about when people start getting the ump in your face reality of death and what kind of chaos that could ensue well so i actually i have been following there was this uh british couple that they were i don't know if it was i don't remember where that uh famous cruise ship docked but they got off a cruise ship in japan and they went into hospital in japan 
And they weren't, I don't think they, I haven't checked if they were actually YouTubers professionally, but I, I doubt it. It was just this old British couple who went into hospital in Japan and he was like vlogging each day of like being in the hospital and then um, going home and what was that like? And he was getting like millions and millions of views. So it's going to be a lot of normal people who just want to share their experience rather than the typical YouTube vloggers that are going to get the most out of this. But the one thing I find kind of strange is like, I don't know what it is, but there's so many people now saying like, you know, don't, don't go outside at all. Don't go outside at all. And I get that if you're in a, like a cramped city environment where there's a lot of people who are not doing social distancing, that is probably not a good idea to go out. But if you're in an area where it's like you have your own house or you have a lot of, you know, open space and parks around wherever you are, there shouldn't be anything wrong with going outside if you're not going to interact with anyone and you're keeping your distance. So I don't know why there, I don't know why there's some people that are saying that you should just be stuck in your house, you know, for three months. That's not realistic. Yeah. Like if you have a if you have like a backyard and and shit like that, it's it's fine to go out in the yard as long as a neighbor is not like hacking their lungs out on the other side of the fence or something. Like it's okay to go for walks as long as you are keeping your distance from everybody. I think one thing that we keep reiterating over this past week in the mumble is this, you know, slow motion car crash of this incident, and like we are in just such the early phases of that where we're in this like this rumor mill phase. I mean, like we experienced this in the Superdome and Katrina. There's like, it's really hard to get signaled information, like information confirmed and to find the signal and people, you know, there's, there's a rumor phase where like information is just kind of running wild right now. And everybody's, I mean, I've, I've seen personally a lot of the, uh, you know, people trying to shame guys like us and, you know, people that are trying to self isolate and, you know, take this seriously and try to self regulate this situation. It's like a lot of people are kind of uh, upset with it. But I mean, there's going to be a lot of this where it's like people are adjusting to the isolation, but they're also adjusting to this fear and they're also going to be dealing with it. And it's, it's kind of you're forced into it. So I mean, there's going to definitely be some more information like that in probably the, the coming uh, weeks where it's just going to be hard to confirm any of this stuff. And the best thing you could do is just take care of yourself and your loved ones. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I'm a little paranoid like that where I've got, I mean, I've, I've legitimately got a towel under my door because I just don't know the risk right now. I don't know. Like, I do know that it's airborne. I do know that it's more contagious than flu. I know that it's airborne in droplets, but I mean, like, there are days where we get rain here and i mean like you know that rain is air from the you know, west coast like the seattle area where this thing is really bad well, and i mean it's like you know your your door with that you know you know i did i hope i'm not going too far here but you know you're you're in a apartment building and that's a hallway where people could be coughing and shit and things hanging in the air for a little while that's not the craziest thing in the world if you're cohabitating with other people in a building you know what i mean yeah i guess i should make that like uh yeah i am sharing a building so that's kind of one of the reasons why i do it but i'm doing it on the deadly serious level of like whenever amazon groceries get delivered hey the rubber gloves come on the mask comes on the disinfectant wipes come out i go outside i disinfect things but i've been hearing other things as far as just like if you could leave it there for days to disinfect like uh, there's just all these measures that were taken where people are like, this could be crazy that you're taking these measures might not be. It's really like a wait and see situation. And this is all about just trying to cover your ass. So I get where some people are just like, they're just like, I don't, I'm not sure if it's okay to even breathe the air. It's funny because yeah, in a group chat the other day, somebody was like, you know, it's okay to go for a hike. The trees aren't going to kill you. And I posted a gift from a, uh, Marky Mark in the happening where the trees were killing people. And it's like, it is a weird time. <laughs> yeah, but it's, you know, this is all I have to say about it. Refusing to take precautionary methods right now is not going to hurt anybody but you and those around you. Well, some people are upset that we're taking such precautions, but that's, uh, that's all right. I mean, 
we'll we'll see whether or not it's off or not or you know whatever the hindsight issue would we'll just give it a couple of weeks a couple of months and we'll see mm-hmm. so uh what's going on with the uh like you know all this stuff going on it's got everybody paranoid i guess the government is too uh what are they what are they thinking about doing in this so the white house and the cdc for the past few days have been talking to Facebook, Google, and other tech companies about smartphone location data to try to do, um, you know, infection tracing with big data the way that places like China and Korea have. And I am very uncomfortable with this right now because they're just, you know, in context, like the Earn It Act being pushed through Congress right now. There's also another act I'm not sure is widely known called the Kids Act, which would literally make things like upvoting or likes illegal to have on an internet platform. Um, This is the environment this move is being made in. And they're giving all the typical placations of it'll be anonymized data. It won't have people's names on it. And shove that up your ass. Because when you're talking location data, oh, you don't have my name? You see where I live, you fucking idiot. You think we're fucking stupid? You have any fucking legal citizen with a registered address's fucking location. I find out which fucking signal is at that location. It's probably you. Like, how fucking stupid do they think we are? that that information is not going to translate and tie itself to fucking legal identities and and actual individuals. No, it will. And frankly, this is going to be a very tough spot here because this would be a very useful thing to rapidly trace and mitigate spreading of this. But absolutely not at that type of invasive cost in terms of privacy with our government. No, like at this point, fuck that. They should have nothing to do with that. If a system like that is going to be fucking done, these companies already have this data. These companies can already fucking tag things. Just have them do it themselves. There is absolutely no reason to spread that information further than it already is to do something like this. If this is something people actually think is necessary, is something that should be done, then just have these companies do it. There is no fucking reason if this is going to be done to get the government directly involved. Well, this is one of those things where it's like, why are you taking all these steps? Why are you self-isolating? Like, why are you doing this? And it's like, you know, markets, we are in a market and markets are natural and this is all about self-regulation because we don't want this kind of regulation coming in i mean really it is a situation where if this gets really really out of hand i could see them trying to push more and more measures like this and uh yeah this is something that i think we might have speculated about on the last episode as far as like them tracing coughs and everything and well now it's like i've even seen some uh, discussions on twitter about the way this was done in China, as far as like if somebody tests positive, then anybody that that person's been geolocated with in the past 14 days gets a text message that they have to be tested, which like if this creates a real situation where a lot of people are facing real problems, whether it's uh, lung damage or death or like just being really sick, sick or you know, it could create this fear and it could also just create this model of like who gets to go outside, who has freedoms, who doesn't. It's like a, it's a very slippery slope and we need to be watching this with extra precaution and just making sure that we're doing the best we can to avoid this by, uh, by ensuring that we're taking care of ourselves. We don't need this big overreach nanny state to say like, hey, you're, uh, you're not allowed to go outside anymore. Or you are. And I mean, that's what we're dealing with right now. I mean, a week ago today when we were doing the episode, it was shutting down the European travel. It was shutting down the international travel. This week, it's closing the borders with Canada and Mexico. I mean, is it a week from today? They're shutting down state borders and, you know, they're really starting to tighten the strings on this. I don't know. But for sure, these steps are very close to getting on the edge of what could be considered unconstitutional. So we really have to watch this. 
Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of people out there are going to call this irresponsible, but I'm not bringing my phone anywhere with me if I have to go outside in the middle of this. Like that, it's it's not coming with me. It's staying at home. And, you know, it's it's just fuck this. Like this, this is a shit show situation, but I am not just going to roll over and allow my government to become openly totalitarian on this soil like that. No, like there, there, there is no fucking way that is happening. I, my, no. my response to that is what phone? Exactly. Yeah. I think we should start that best practice measure right now as a Bitcoin community and understanding like what this all is. It's like, hey, best practices as the community, if you're about to go, you know, for a walk because you've been cooped up for a week or two and you need to get outside just because you are a human and you need to get outside. And you're not going to worry about this. Like, leave the phone at home. Yeah. Like, I, I could I really could appreciate and understand if companies like Google or Facebook themselves were going to do something like track infections and just let people know so that they can take precautions personally themselves. I would get that, but I am not okay with tying that directly into government surveillance programs. Like, no. Oh, <clears throat> sorry. Yeah. Like that's uh that's just, this is something that's going to be, it's going to be moving forward. We just have to make sure that it is, uh, it's being done in a way that keeps people's constitutional rights in place and that this doesn't turn into a slippery slope that there's not really a coming back from. And, um, you know, I just, uh, yeah, we just got to keep uh, our eyes on this because it's very important and it's going to be, it's going to be happening in the next couple of weeks. I mean, these things, the stuff is moving fast, but I mean, they got legislation drafted up for stuff we're going to talk about later as far as UBI for next week. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised if they got this stuff up. I, I, we I don't think we covered they they reauthorized the Patriot Act like they're doing this stuff they're they're moving forward. Mm -hmm. And then I think next up, uh, Rick, you got a little update on some major supply line changes at least with one company. Yeah, for sure, supply chains are going to be critical in this. And uh, Amazon Delivery Services said in an announcement on Tuesday that they will be pri prioritizing household staple items and medical supplies. So food and medical supplies and uh, staples as far as like uh, paper towels and trash bags, those sort of things. Let's see, here's a quote from the statement saying, quote, We believe our role serving customers and the community during this time is a critical one, and we want to make sure our customers can get the items they need we, when they need them. As COVID-19 has spread, We've recently seen an increase in people shopping online, which has had an impact on how we serve our customers. So in the short term, we are making the decision to temporarily prioritize household staples, medical supplies, and other high demand products coming into our fulfillment centers so we can move quickly, receive, restock, and ship these products to customers. We are working around the clock with our selling partners to ensure availability of these essential products and continue to bring on additional capacity to deliver customer orders, close quote. And uh, yeah, my Amazon fresh order was canceled and refunded over uh, the last weekend. And uh, before this announcement, Amazon said they would be hiring 100,000 additional employees to try and cover this. And then like I placed an order at the beginning of this week, that order did get through, was delivered, 90% of the order was fulfilled. So like they are kind of, continuing to pick up the slack on that but uh sorry amazon employees these hundred thousand new employees are sounding the alarm bells that contamination isn't being taken seriously with people still getting very limited time on bathroom breaks and uh, crowded hallways and uh, fulfillment centers and uh, people not having the proper equipment as far as gloves and masks to handle the equipment handle the shipping and uh yeah, it's uh, hard to say how Amazon is going to deal with this crisis. Like every industry right now, I mean, this could be a make or break moment. And uh, will the efficiency of the Amazon supply chain, you know, snap in line and deliver in this moment of crisis with actual ability to handle supplies that aren't contaminated and, and keep moving forward and people aren't going to get uh, the spread of this virus? Or, you know, is it going to be something where this is one of those uh, major arteries that's been uh maybe moving viruses around and everything and people aren't really taking this seriously and 
you know, they're not decontaminating their groceries as it comes in, and then more people are getting sick, and this might move towards a more localized effort of grocery delivery and delivery of essential goods. I know that whenever my Amazon fresh order was canceled last week, I started thinking about the, just the game theory of it, of why and everything, and I started thinking about how, well, you know, they're kind of forcing the person that needs the supplies to go get the groceries, but... uh but I guess they're uh, they're still going to try and continue to fulfill the groceries. But um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see maybe s continued constraints on those ability for them to actually deliver based upon like what's actually going on at the grocery store in your local area. I mean, there are some grocery stores across the country that are having riots break out over certain items and certain items aren't getting restocked. And the ability on them to deliver on these things is all going to be based upon what's going on in that local supply chain. So things are going to get uh, definitely um, squirrely for Amazon, and we'll see how things go forward. But, uh, yeah, that's what's going on right now. They're prioritizing some items just to make sure that these fulfillment centers keep moving the goods that they need. I mean, uh, just uh, real quick before I let go of the mic button, I was thinking – I was searching toilet paper last night. You see some weird brands right now. They're they're reaching out to some extraordinary suppliers to try and fulfill some of the demands that they have right now. So uh, it'll be interesting following this just to see how they uh, how they evolve with this uh, virus and how uh, the macroeconomic of supply chains and everything work out with this virus. And on a personal level, you know, this means electronics, books, like things that are not going to be considered essential um amazon has the stock they have and when they run out of that they're not restocking it like they're using all of their warehouse space for the most important stuff so if there are things that you want or things that you think you might need that you think might not fall into the important shit category they're going to be prioritizing I would try to get that now because those types of things are not going to be restocked when they run out in the warehouse. Yeah, just uh, for instance, whenever I was covering the store, getting the story together last night, I uh, kind of quickly ran uh, to over to Amazon and ordered a French press because mine, half of it, the glass is broken and I've still been using it because, well, I just like using things until they just absolutely fall apart. But for months now, I've been like, you really need to replace that French press. So... Went ahead and picked that up, and I also had some Bluetooth headphones that kind of crapped out on me uh, recently where I was like, ooh, those were some nice, cheap Bluetooth headphones. Might as well try and grab those again uh, before, like we're saying. Uh, I mean, hopefully uh, things continue on not too affected, but if things start to get really bad, I wouldn't be surprised if, like, uh, yeah, things really start to grind down. Mm -hmm. All right. And I guess Janine... Uh... You're up for something that is probably going to make me fucking furious. Yeah, this is a pretty fun one. Um, so if you were a victim of Mount Gox, uh, you may have been contacted last summer by a guy named Michael Hurrigan, who is the managing director of a company called Fortress Investment Group, because they were offering to buy up claims for only $900 per Bitcoin. Well, it turns out that um, Fortress Investment Group is full of scumbags. Uh, I'm basically just going to read an article by Mike Masnick oh, from TechDirt. No, I, I can hear. It might have been your connection. Okay. I'm still good. Yeah. Got you now. Okay. So, yeah, I'm basically going to read an article by Mike Masnick um, from TechDirt because he uh, infuses his writing with enough sarcasm that I don't have to do it myself. Um, basically, he published an article on March 16th titled, SoftBank owned patent troll using monkey selfie law firm sues to block COVID-19 testing using Theranos patents. If you think that title sounds a bit crazy, uh, you're right and perceptive. Um, so quote, honestly, I wasn't sure how to begin this story or how to fit all the insanity into the title. It's a story involving patents, patent trolling, COVID-19, Thranos, and even the company that brought us all WeWork, SoftBank. 
Oh, and also Irel and Manella, the same law firm that once claimed it could represent a monkey in a copyright infringement dispute. You see, Irel and Manella has now filed one of the most utterly bullshit patent infringement lawsuits you'll ever see. They are representing Labrador Diagnostics LLC, a patent troll which does not seem to exist other than to file this lawsuit and which claims to hold the rights to two patents, um, which you'll note were originally granted to Elizabeth Holmes and Thranos, the firm that shut down in scandal over medical testing equipment that appears to have been oversold and never actually worked. Holmes is still facing federal charges of wire fraud over the whole Theranos debacle. However, back in 2018, the remains of Theranos sold its patents to Fortress Investment Group. Fortress Inve Investment Group is a soft bank funded massive patent troll. You may remember the name from the time last fall when Apple and Intel sued the firm, laying out how Fortress is a sort of uber patent troll, uh, gathering up a bunch of patents and then shaking down basically everyone. Lovely, right? So the SoftBank-owned patent troll, Fortress, bought up Thrano's patents and then set up this shell company, Labrador Diagnostics, which decided that right in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, <clears throat> it was going to sue one of the companies making COVID-19 tests, saying that its tests violate those Thrano's patents and literally demanding that the court bar the firm from making those COVID-19 tests. Uh, and so that was a that basically sums up how bullshit this is. And then uh, he notes that they uh, uh, basically Fortress is arguing that the defendants, this company making the COVID-19 test, should be, quote, ordered to pay ongoing royalties to Labrador for a for any post-judgment infringement of the asserted patents. Lovely. You kind of wonder how these people sleep at night doing this kind of shit. Um, but some good news, uh, kind of related to this topic, uh, Naomi Wu, who I've mentioned before, she's a DIY open source maker in China, recently shared a story about a hospital in Italy, which ran out of ICU valves. And, uh, basically the founder of the fab lab in Milan was quote, contacted by the editor. Um, actually this isn't a quote, this is me. Uh, basically, a fab lab in Milan was contacted by the editor of an Italian regional newspaper who explained, uh, quote, that the hospital in uh, Brescia, uh, near one of the hardest hit regions of coronavirus infections, urgently needed valves for an intensive care device and that the supplier could not provide them in a short time. Running out of the valves would have been dramatic and some people might have lost their lives. So she asked it if it would be possible to 3D print them. After several phone calls to fab labs and companies in Milan and Brescia, uh, and then fortunately a company in the area, um, responded to the call for help through its founder and CEO who brought up a 3D printer directly to the hospital and in just a few hours redesigned and then produced the missing piece. Uh, end quote. So yeah. God forbid that uh, some corporate know-nothing uh, assholes somewhere else in the world might have ruined this heroic effort by claiming intellectual property over the design of a tube. Um, if you were one of the people who got an email uh, or letter from Fortress about your Bitcoin, uh, maybe you can take some time uh, while you're cooped up inside over the next couple of weeks or months and write them a big fuck you response. Yeah. Uh, I am very confident that by the other side of this, people are going to look at patent laws in a completely different light. And even if there are judges completely disconnected from reality enough to rule in favor of infringement cases like this, nobody in their fucking right mind is going to pay a damn bit of attention to that ruling. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of people were saying like, oh, well, this is so dumb, it's not likely to go through anyway, but the problem is that these types of lawsuits, even if they're completely ridiculous, as we have seen from the activities of uh, a certain fake Satoshi, um, just because they're ridiculous, these people who are being sued for infringement still have to get lawyers or some person to be able to respond to these threats, uh, and that costs money. So even if it ends up being a dud, um, it's still going to lose the money because they're going to have some amount of legal fees, even if they don't, you know, go to court or anything. Oh yeah, and speaking of which, um, if anybody out there 
finds themselves in a situation like that or finds somebody else they know in a situation like that as far as information that is patent infringing, contact Naomi Wu. She is offering to publicly distribute any types of designs or information necessary to build patented things during this and pretty much tell whatever company, go fuck yourself, you can come and try and sue me in China. So spread that as far and wide as you can. Yeah, this seemed to be like one of the worst stories of this past week is people trying to solve the problem and you see this sort of uh, yeah response of people trying to just take advantage of the situation uh, of others trying to save other people's lives. And this is where it's like um, some of these systems that have been running for a long time that have been keeping a lot of people well fed because of inefficiencies in the system might just go by the wayside, hopefully. Maybe people will start, you know, really pointing this out and saying that this stuff needs to needs to end whenever it's something that, that could save potentially thousands of lives um, overnight, but they're going to hold up because of the potential lawsuit now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Naomi, Naomi put it nice and short in one of the tweets I saw where she said, get the specs, make what the doctors ask for and break whatever IP you need to save lives. Mm -hmm. Right on. All right, what's the next one again? I think that's uh, Janine with uh, some update from Shitcoin oh. Land. Yeah, this one was actually, like, that was a terrible story. This one, on the other hand, uh, it's pretty comical. Yeah, I mean, this one is just, it's so hilarious because um, I was actually, when I saw the story, I was writing a response to someone who was asking, like, you know, does it, doesn't Ethereum solve scaling issues better than Bitcoin does? And then I read this. And so um, on March 14th, not too long ago, there was a Medium post published by White Rabbit about some serious ongoing issues with MakerDAO. Um, White Rabbit, if you don't know, uh, describes themselves as a research company that provides uh, a range of services from crypto consulting to smart contract security audits. And uh, they write, uh, quote, the drop in Ether, the Ether price, along with the blockchain congestion led to the emergence of the negative MakerDAO protocol system surplus, uh, parentheses, a debt to the platform, which appeared uh, due to 5.67 million die being uncollateralized. It, this problem arose not because of a sharp drop in price and lack of collateral, but due to the manipulations of initiative keepers or liquidators. Uh, it should be mentioned that liquidators use scripts uh, from MakerDAO that are not programmed for adjusting high gas prices um, or adjusting to high gas prices. This led to the number of liquidators who could participate in auctions being reduced. One of the users came up with the idea that problems with the network create a unique opportunity to profit and they began sending minimal die fractions uh, in bid at the auction. As there were no computers at the time, they have received lots uh, of up to, um, lots of up to 50 ETH uh, for their near zero bid die. Um, over time, the network state improved, and other liquidators adopted these tactics. Um, and Nikolai Mushigan, uh, who's the co-founder and former chief architect of MakerDAO, commented on Twitter, quote, I just learned that the core Maker flop auction mechanics were changed much more dramatically than I realized. Maker governance is able to set the starting price directly as well as the delay. The auction should have kicked off two days ago and cleared with organic price discovery. MakerDAO needs to let the Maker debt auction clear and stop pulling levers that were never supposed to be under governance control. This will end badly and it will be due to the active choices of a small group of people unless you let the market do its thing immediately. Um, especially tragic because it was specifically designed to handle contractions gracefully, but it was twisted into something different by power brokers who wanted to be the board of a new global central bank, end quote. Wow, a smart contract with a central control mechanism got taken control of when the obvious liquidation cascade happened based on insanely volatile collateral? Who could have seen that coming? But stable coin. <laughs> Die. Oh my goodness. This was like such a thing where yesterday, like last week, and you know, everything was down except for multi-collateral die. It was very evident that something was awry in that system. 
And yeah, it's just crazy to me that they just think they can uh, they can correct this by uh, maybe bringing on USDC. I think that's like the next move they're trying to do. Dude, see, and it's it's so insane because it's it, like this model of stablecoin has been tried like three or four times. You you get a, a stupid volatile thing like cryptocurrency, and then try to over collateralize something like a fiat token with that, and then the price crashes and it implodes. Bitshares did it. Uh, one of the Bitshares spinoffs did it. Like this, it, it's like this has been tried over and over. And it always fails. The way to do a stable coin, which are very useful things, is to get the actual thing that you are tying its value to and hold that. It's real simple. You know, it's like how banks used to work. If they had a, a, a gold bar, they gave you gold certificates backed by the gold bar. They didn't get a bunch of rocks and go, hmm, if things go well, this pile of rocks could be worth just as much. Of the no, they held the gold. That's how that works, stupid. I'm sorry. I'm getting like trying to respond to messages. Mm -hmm. But it's just like it's like, guys, people made this mistake many times already for you. Um, maybe learn from that. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just watching Maker, and there's another project here locally where they do like this thing called quadratic funding, which is supposedly like power funding or something. It's one of these consensus uh, unicorn projects they like, and um, yeah, all of them is based off of overcomplicated smart contracts off of a asset that is not secure, so runs into trouble. Mm -hmm. Speaking of uh the banks though, um I think there's actually some uh some mixed bag uh potentially good news coming on that front while all of this is happening. Yeah, right on. I mean like while uh you know UBI is coming out and reserves have been eliminated and uh, lots of uh repo trillions being printed uh on Wednesday, this past Wednesday, the FDIC approved the deposit insurance application for Square Financial Services, which means Square Cash and the Cash App are now backed, fully backed financial institutions from a licensing standpoint. Basically, the Cash App will be a quote unquote de novo industrial bank. This is a uh, statement from the FDIC quote, The FDIC evaluates all applications for deposit insurance, including those for industrial banks, based on the same statutory factors in the Federal Deposit Insurance Act. It has been more than a decade since the FDIC has approved deposit insurance for an industrial bank or industrial loan company, close quote. And they approved uh, this one. So it's been, I guess, more than a decade and they approved Square Cash. And with this change in status, Square Cash can now issue loans through their payment system and will likely see their first commercial customers in 2021. Square Bank will be headquartered in Salt Lake City, Utah, where it's currently still waiting approval from the Utah Department of Financial Institutions. And, uh, yeah, we had speculated about the possibility of using these new payment systems to try and push out UBI if there's uh, liquidity issues with the banks. And since UBI had been a big part of the news this past week, this legislation currently, the legislation that we're talking about is currently being drafted up and being amended and uh, back and forth, it should be passed next week. I think like we've been hearing numbers between 2,000 and 1,300, maybe less, maybe more. Uh, who knows right now? It's still kind of all being drafted up. But that stuff should be getting pushed out next week. Steve Mnuchin, whenever he was in the press conference uh, this week talking about it, they were saying they wanted this out to the American public now. Now, now, now. And so uh, they're trying to use every avenue they have available to them. And for sure, we've seen Square Cash and, uh, and Trump and Twitter and all these companies kind of talk behind doors for a while now. And it, w it wasn't too surprising to me to see this. I mean, it was surprising. It wasn't too surprising, though. Like, we were kind of speculating that this could happen. And so, uh, yeah, this uh, looks like our Square Cash app is now a uh, it's now a De Novo bank. All right, yeah, De Novo industrial bank. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it, it is a KYC service. It, it, that is what it is. But, you know, they're, at least from 
my interactions with them a pretty solid one so far that isn't actively trying to fuck people who use them and you know square and cash app have really been killing it since all of this started i mean like you know cash app does those those regular money giveaways through cash app they have been doing those more frequently since this really started getting bad in the u.s and they're even denominating giveaways in bitcoin now if people want them and like there are um there are fiat processor for the the bitcoin shirt shop um me and mr hodl and like they on that side of things um they're doing awesome shit um like we don't use any of the the like uh higher level services beyond payment processing but they sent a, an email out to all their customers anybody who uses those other services beyond bare payment processing they're having all their subscription fees for the month refunded um they're not being charged for them going forward they're working on setting up curbside pickup and delivery options for as many like meat space small businesses who use them as possible they're even retooling how the physical um, point of sale terminals work so that people do not have to touch them more than absolutely necessary to process a payment with a card like they are and uh, you know with this this bank status from the fdic i'm sure they're in a position now that they can actually start making loans to individuals and small businesses like they are knocking it the fuck out of the park in terms of how do they actually help their customers as much as possible right now yeah i mean uh you know they're definitely a good uh stack and sats app i mean everybody who likes to stack sats they usually go through the cash app because it makes it a very easy experience and uh yeah i mean they've been they're definitely been a kyc service for a long time but as far as like they allow you to withdraw your bitcoin i haven't seen them uh you know necessarily shut down any uh well, I'm not going to talk about that, but like uh, for sure, they've, they've definitely been doing the best they can for the ecosystem. And um, it's good to see that they've got this sort of level of credibility and licensing and, and it's something that's available for people. I mean, maybe they will give options in this legislation. They'll say like, you know, you could get it this way, this way or this way. It's going to be through, you know, some government website or however it's done and I don't know the potential to get your UBI through your cash app and just like stack sats with it that easy seems like a pretty nice thing to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think that they are going to be trying to make themselves as much of an asset to users and customers as possible through this and not just looking for like, how can they fucking milk everybody for as much as they're worth? Yeah, I mean, you know me, I don't I don't use KYC stuff for Bitcoin, but I might be interested in using it for fiat. Um the only thing is I'm assuming that the application process for opening an account probably involves a driver's license, which I don't have. <laughs> I'm not sure actually. They they might take something like a passport. Um but yeah, it is, um, I think Cash App's only available in the US and the UK. So that is going to be kind of limited use um, outside of those jurisdictions. Hey, I don't think uh, it's in the news, but I just like mentioned this while we're on this. Like, uh, I know that they're also talking about they extended the uh, taxes to, uh, to where we don't have to worry about that until July 15th. So that's a good thing. Yeah, although I do want to say on that front, um, that is the payment deadline. Like they have not changed the the filing deadline. So everybody still has to file by April 15th. Um, they're just extending payments to July 15th, the last I saw. Yeah, I think uh, this morning they moved it. But uh, okay. yeah, this information is definitely, like we're saying, everything's moving so quickly. It's there's some stuff that we're like, should we cover it? It's like, well, we'd probably give it a couple of days just to confirm that sort of stuff. But yeah, this morning they were talking about the uh, even the filing deadline. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, yeah, if everybody out there, I would, um, I would go double check that through a primary source because the last thing I saw was that it was just the payment date that was moved, not the filing. Yes. Uh, this is a great time to definitely confirm all your information 
uh, even through here because like, I mean, like, okay. You guys okay. Just... Yeah. Um, somebody just dropped in the, the chat box. Um, Steve Mnuchin on Twitter is confirming directly the filing and payments are moved. Okay. But yeah, go look at that tweet from Steve Mnuchin and confirm it for yourself because there has been a lot of, uh, disinformation going around on Twitter and different social media and everything. So just, uh, be in the, in the mode of confirming your information. Yeah. I just, I just, with that, that one particularly, I want to make sure everybody doesn't misinterpret something because getting fucked by the IRS on the other end of this is going to be the last thing you want to deal with. Yeah, well, I don't. What I what I find on the on the subject of UBI, what I find really funny about these people that are saying like, "Oh, UBI, um, this is going to be great. It's free money." It's like the chances are that's just going to be you know add like for everyone they send a thousand or two thousand dollars whatever the number is um that's probably just going to be in the national debt and so what is it the average person owes like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars um chunk of the national debt so it's just going to go up by that much so it's not it's not free money it's just debt that you are presumed to pay off at some point um or at least you as a, a debt slave are tasked with paying off um but the really funny thing though is because my income is so low i'm probably going to end up if they actually do that i don't know if i count but if they do end up doing that um i'm probably going to get more money from that scheme than i actually pay in taxes <laughs> like massively more <laughs> so that's going to be interesting yeah that's uh Let's just say that I am kind of shocked at some of the attitudes I see out there. Like, if that is what it takes to get people through this, it's what it takes. But that's not something to, to cheer or be happy about in my mind because the, the consequences that will have on the economy in the long term are going to be massive. Yeah, I mean, the... Like, it's just going to be inflationary, like the value of the dollar is, I mean, it's not fucked at the moment because it's like the least fucked of other currencies throughout the world. But like, it's yeah, it's bad for the economy. It's bad for the long term value of the dollar, which we already knew, but now it's going to get even worse. So, yeah, <laughs> it's like the, 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 the de decay of the dollar <laughs> is just going to accelerate with this. So, yeah, you get a thousand to two thousand a month or whatever money now but in the long term like if you're depending on the u.s dollar holding its value it's not going to happen <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah this is going to be so weird going forward i'm just thinking about how it's like uh there's really not much option i mean if everybody is isolating and there's not much uh economic activity moving around and you see all these uh, bailouts of these companies it's hard to do all this again i mean it's it's crazy, but I mean, like I woke up this morning, it's like you, you see all these daily just different amounts that the Fed is printing, and they're talking now like a trillion dollars a day for the rest of March, which that's another 10, 11 days, you know? I mean, yeah. uh, that's crazy. Dude, the money so supply is going to explode, and the fucking Fed's balance sheet is going to explode, and this is just going to be a fucking nightmare. I wonder if the rate at which they're printing dollars is more than the rate at which people are getting infected with the virus. <laughs> By yeah, massive orders. Yeah, probably more. Uh, I know it's contagious, but it ain't as contagious as pressing that print button. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's, let's, let's jump along into some nice news that doesn't have Good to do call. with this stupid shit. So... In the past two weeks, um, there's been some tweaks and modifications to the specification for Watchtower uh, protocol specs that are going to eventually be pulled into the, the proper Bolt specification for the Lightning protocol. And I figure let's, let's go through some of this because um, I think they're kind of moving towards clear trade-off decisions rather than just the amorphous mess of um, there's, there's really a million ways you can do watchtowers with all kinds of different trade-offs. Um, 
so pretty much right now the spec is considering actually finding watchtowers out of scope so they're not designing any kind of discovery service or protocol for them they're just working on the actual interactions between the client and server but the f and they're also um you know leaving this open to um spec uh, extensions as well but the the just mm, let's start here so the the first thing they seem to be leaning towards is pretty much registering a pseudonymous identity with a watchtower and this is done because frankly watchtowers are probably going to be pretty resource intensive um until we get to a point where L2 is actually something supported on the base layer and we don't have to constantly add extra data with the watchtower having to track everything for an active channel. So pretty much they, they're specking out a simple handshake procedure where a user would register a public key with the watchtower server um, and the watchtower would be able to effectively respond back details with how it's working. So it would give a maximum size of a, an appointment, which is kind of what they're calling um, like each individual channel state and revocation um, transaction. So when I say appointment, I'm referring to a specific um, channel update that the watchtower is keeping track of. But they will inform you after the registration handshake what their maximum appointment size is, um, how much they charge for that, um, as well as optionally a uh, Bolt 11 lightning invoice if they're going to charge for the services they're providing rather than just do so altruistically. Um, and they're also designing a setup where pretty much the watchtower would sign an acknowledgement of actually agreeing to watch for a specific channel state. So after you've actually gone through and registered your public key with the watchtower, um, pretty much what happens is you go to give it an appointment for a channel state. And that is put together in its own data structure with the size for each relevant parts of it. Um, the locator, which is pretty much the first half of the transaction ID for that commitment transaction um, that would need to be penalized. Um, the encrypted penalty transaction, and then a signature on all of that from the private key that you registered with the watchtower as an account. And when a watchtower receives all of this and verifies it, um, pretty much it would sign a receipt over the entire signed message you provided. So the watchtower's signature would include the individual signature for what you're giving it. So this way you prove an integrity check that a user registered with this watchtower signed off and okayed what they're, they're saying um, the watchtower is being provided and supposed to look at. And the watchtower signs an acknowledgement of that. And so the watchtower wouldn't be capable of faking the user's signature going, this is what I want you to watch. And the whole idea behind this is to kind of have some kind of reputational check where if a watchtower um, didn't actually respond with a penalty transaction or provide the services that you paid for, you would have a, a reputational proof that they actually had agreed and committed to that um, to kind of publicly show this watchtower isn't a, a reputable watchtower. And in addition to that, they've also specced out um, a format for updating specific um, channel state penalty transactions. So if you want to modify how you would handle um, a channel breach in a, any specific channel state through that, you can go through and actually update what the watchtower is holding on um, to respond to that, as well as um, a authenticated um, delete 
like everything you're tracking for something um, protocol. So that let's say you're using a watchtower and you closed one of the channels that they're monitoring, um, you can notify them and have everything for that channel deleted to free up some of the, the watchtower space, one that you're paying for, and two that the, the watchtower actually has to bear the cost for. And so, you know, I think there's, you know, I, I think when all is said and done, there are definitely going to be people out there probably deviating from this spec and trying to do other models of watchtowers. But I think to start, this is probably a good way to go. I mean, especially the registering an identity with the watchtower um, to kind of protect it as a denial of service protection mechanism is absolutely necessary until we actually get the the pieces and the base protocol that we need for L2. Because until that happens, if you have a channel and you're using a watchtower for it, the amount of data that watchtower has to handle constantly grows. And so the, there just has to be something um, that just prevents people from being able to spam watchtowers with garbage nonstop. Otherwise, th those would just get blasted off the internet. But I think this is uh, you know, some pretty nice uh, developments and things are moving towards a concrete spec. And once that really shapes itself out, I'm betting with the pace things are taking in that side of things that uh, we'll start seeing watchtowers pop up pretty soon. Yeah, man, that's one of those uh, dynamics we've been talking about on the Lightning Network we've needed for quite a while, just uh, a way to make sure that these channels are, the liquidity's there and it's available and, you know, it's, uh, I'm I'm just, anything that's uh, updating the Lightning development to where we can start to put in all the pieces to where that layer is going to be running efficiently, yeah, good work, guys. Chino, did you forget that your button is yep. new on that keyboard? See? I told you, I told you that that yet, was going to happen. Hey, at least I remembered, I remembered to ask you. <laughs> but um, yeah, okay. I think I'm going to just dive along into the next one though. Um, not really too much um, for, I'm going to say about it because I'm still kind of slow step reasoning through the, the script structures involved. But Jeremy Rubin just pushed out a kind of tweaked um, refined proposal for the non-interactive um, lightning channels that his op CTB proposal would actually enable. And, you know, I really just, I want to drive home how useful this would be. Like it, it would allow a third party person to open a payment channel, say like Janine, on chain rick could just open a payment channel between you and me without either of us being involved in it effectively by creating a funding transaction that makes a a channel output that has a, a branch kind of moving to a, a normal lightning channel and then a branch that would just kind of slowly allow um either of us to just close the channel out so she could pretty much open it without either of our involvement. We could use that if we want, or the, the channel could just kind of walk towards automatically closing out on chain if we don't want to use it. And to take things another step further with that op CTV functionality, you can again, you know, I've said this a few times on the, on the show, you can make a, a payment channel that is one way and I can just push money to you without you having to be online and sign each payment through that channel rig so like i could just make the payments without you having to sign anything and then when you come back online and see all the money i've sent you like you could just close that whenever you want so like you know i can just non-interactively make payments through the lightning network and you know it's i i really want to say for this one in particular, folks, go check the show notes and um, check the link uh, for this in there. It kind of runs through a quick explanation and a, a graph of the structure of this, as well as all the individual um, script um, structures for each step in all of this. But also, if you go um, on the top 
and check the use cases section of the page. Um, he's got pretty much all of the uses um, that are well defined or thought through that op CTV could be put to um, explained in their own articles. And this is something that gets a lot more useful than just, you know, somebody could open a channel for us or a one way channel like this is, you know, I, I used to think that if we got Schnorr and Taproot and we got SIG hash, no input, then that's good. Lock it down. Like I, I don't really care about anything else making it into the protocol. Um, I'm, I'm adding op CTV to that list of things, get those and then lock it down. We will soon have all the things, all the tools that we need to uh, create this world of the future for sure. All right. Uh, there's not any comment on that. Janine, anything on these lightning developments? All right. What can we do while we're all cooped up inside, Rick? Well, that's what I'm saying. You know, this is the world of the future and uh, VR meetups and remote meetings. It's all the rave right now. I mean, everyone is trying to adjust to self-isolation and explore these new environments. I've even hosted a couple of remote meetings now. I mean, one in the Mumble from last week, one in Zoom yesterday. And uh, next week we'll be on Jitsi, which like these are just uh, remote platforms where you can have these video conference calls and these meetings. But last night, me and you, we and uh, and Nadav Cohen, we were uh, we were having fun in Mozilla Hubs, you know, running around in this VR space. And uh, it's one of the few spaces that you know people can come together and collaborate and discuss interesting topics like Bitcoin. And you can see, you know, the way that a discussion kind of flows naturally than the video conferencing format. And another one of these VR spaces is Altspace VR. And Udi's been running that VR meetup group for a few weeks now, but tomorrow, Saturday, March 21st, they'll have a special guest, Britt Kelly from BTC Pay Server. Uh, they have uh, this, uh, let's, let's see, this is a quote from the, from the tweet, or from Udi's message, rather. He's got like his own meetup platform with like, I like what he's doing over there. So, quote, the open source BTC pay project includes a suite of tools for online merchants who accept Bitcoin and Lightning payments. But did you know it can do much more like help manage events or host your personal Bitcoin wallet? Britt Kelly will tell us more about BTC pay and new features that make it much more than just a payment processor. Capacity in VR is limited, but... Be on time to increase your chances of getting in. Unfortunately, you won't be able to join if we exceed maximum capacity. This event is hosted on the Altspace VR platform. If it is available, the most if it if it is available for most VR headsets and also with a VR headset on Windows desktop. That did not sound right. It must they must have wrote that sentence wrong. It's available. Okay, it's available. <laughs> it's available for most VR headsets and also without a VR headset on Windows desktops. Desktops, wow. Some users have success running it on Linux desktops by downloading it through Steam and turning on Steam Play for all apps and games through Steam settings. Close quote. So that was from Udi's post at his uh, Altspace VR meetup website which i think that's just interesting and great that he's creating this new space for people to get together and discuss bitcoin in this moment so yeah i'm going to take a look into this and hopefully i can make it in there i'm supposed to run an errand tomorrow but i'm still going to try and make it in there because uh I, yeah like we we're saying we were playing around with that mozilla hubs last night and it was surprisingly entertaining and i was like i was really shocked by the way you can really sort of through body language, just like of like your head nods or like if you're tired of the discussion, you can kind of just move about the world and people can follow you and you can have your own conversations over there. And it's an interesting concept and uh, it's definitely different than the video meetings or the meet space meetings. And uh, yeah, I mean, as we're got all these new tools and we're all sort of just sitting around, let's put them to use and figure out how to make them very efficient and keep this network a well-oiled machine, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think stuff like that is going to be very important just to, to keep community collaborations going, but also just to keep people sane. You know what I mean? People are social animals, and we are still going to need to find ways to socialize even if we're 
you know, in most places probably all going to be locked up in our homes soon. I don't know if I'm comfortable having a Bitcoin meetup in something called alt space. I think it should be renamed to MaxiPad. <laughs> <laughs> you should make a plea to Udi to create the MaxiPad Coliseum. Yeah. <laughs> No, seriously, I'm with you. I'm like a real social person growing up uh, in like a big Cajun family and just kind of like always wanting to be around people and everything. And yeah, I mean, the mumble has grown. I mean, it's pretty crazy. But uh, like, you know, in these moments, like these virtual spaces start to really fill out. And uh, that virtual, that VR meetup and the VR spaces has been kind of just on the sidelines. Nobody's really been paying attention to it, but I'm I think everybody's starting to tune in now. So that should be a hit tomorrow, Saturday, March 21st. I doubt, you know, uh, whenever this gets uploaded. So if you've heard this, just uh, go to the Altspace VR website and check out Udi's, uh, Udi's Altspace VR for the next one and try to make it in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm going to finally try and make it to that uh, tomorrow because I got a headset for all of this. But uh also think, you know, once I figure out how to get through the... Uh, the other side of all those platforms. I'm going to try and start throwing some uh, events in the gaps between Udi and Hoddle Knots just because, you know, one, I think more things to do during this is never a bad thing, but also um, my headset isn't high end enough to run VR chat. And so fuck you right. elitist fucks running off to fuck off with your custom avatars on your higher end machines. I'm fucking making something for the plebs that don't have a fucking Oculus Rift S with fucking whatever the f all I don't right, even know right. what the yeah, newest yeah. graphics all card right, is. Chill. I haven't chill. had a graphics card in a computer for like 10 years. <laughs> this is where it's like just, I mean, like you got, I mean, yeah, I'm coming into this VR thing as somebody with a seizure disorder. So I'm like one where it's like, man, just give me a browser window that gets me in there and I could move around and I'm good because, you know, if I put those goggles on, yeah, I'll be in that chat for about five minutes before you are like, how come Rick ain't talking? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just talking shit. But, you know, I, I, I just think, you know, like, because th those things do still have kind of, you know, scaling ceilings, like practically, and it probably will, after a point, cause issues for the companies running hosting for stuff um, if everybody's trying to storm into the same thing. So I, I just I just think it would be a good thing if, like, more people capable of running events like that start doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I mean... You know what they said. First, the internet couldn't scale to people sharing photos with each other, and then it did. And then they said it couldn't scale to people sh streaming videos, and then it did. And then people wanted to be in VR chat rooms, and it couldn't scale to that until it did. <laughs> yeah, but it kept scaling to those things by having big, half-subsidized multinational corporations pretty much own all of it. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you're using a lot, a lot of these VR devices are very, uh, let's I say, know. you know, not not very open sourcey and decentralizey. So, I know I got the Oculus Go, uh, the low end Oculus one, uh, specifically because I decided if I was going to bring this demon thing into my home, I'm going to get the one that doesn't have external cameras and external sensors behind the mic. <laughs> there are fields, Neo. <laughs> you have to see them. But seriously, like economies of scale, like require, like we should have another one because, uh, you know, I'm just thinking about these meetups that I'm doing that are remote and they're video. It's like you can only have so many people before it becomes so many people that nobody really even gets an opportunity but to say one thing. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to create like these social situations that create economies of scale where discussions are actually helping everybody move forward. And, yeah, I think it's a great way to actually kind of create that where it's like no longer just – you know, you can cram a hundred people in a Zoom call, but only everybody's going to talk for one minute for an hour and a half. Where uh, you know, you do a hundred people in a in a VR chat, it's like you have maybe like five people next to this little virtual space of a tree, and five people over there under a bridge, and you know, it kind of like it kind of naturally creates the economies that work for the social situation. And um, yeah, I think that's a breakthrough. It's something that could be cool, but yeah. Um, 
Shino, definitely do it. Do it. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we should all go into Minecraft because then we can make block jokes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, what about these uh, real uh, technical blocks coming forward? We got some new, uh, some new stuff from Join Market. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, uh, they released, I think it was four days ago now, um, 0.6.2, a new um, version. And it's really just uh, some, just a few major changes. Um, you know, first off, um, Python 2 is now completely deprecated. Um, so everybody running Join Market, um, if you're not going to continue running an old version, which I advise against, um, Python 3 is required now. Um, the whole um, 2 version of Python, the language, pretty much um, <clears throat> isn't being maintained anymore as of the start of this year. So everything out there is going to be shifting over to 3. But they have also changed the default um, data directory um, to kind of fit with the standards and different operating systems. So anybody moving uh, to this version who was using it previously, you're going to have to manually migrate um, your wallet file and things to the, the new home directory. Um, on Linux, that's going to be um, pretty much home dot join market. Um, I, I don't know with all the other normie stuff. Good luck. <laughs> um, they have also pulled up a no um, history uh, wallet synchronization feature um, that you can use with pruned nodes that'll just scan through um, the UTXO set to find all the wallet balance. Um, although this is kind of a trade-off given that this is a, a privacy wallet, you are not going to get um, any of your transaction history to be able to manage UTXOs carefully. So keep in mind if you do that. And also make sure that you um, set the key pool um, gap limit um, very large because you know CoinJoin wallets like this will churn through lots of addresses quickly. And it's only going to find anything in the UTXO set that your wallet generated the addresses for. So keep that in mind. Um, they've also instituted a automatic freeze of any um, funds sent to an address that has been used before um, to stop forced address reuse attacks or dust attacks. Um, that is something that you can actually set in the configuration. Um, uh, with a policy to kind of not freeze anything if it's over a certain amount. Um, so you can set that up however you want. Um, also, um, what else? Um, there are some improvements uh, with the descending um, functionality. They've tweaked the lock time settings to emulate what Bitcoin Core and Electrum does, which is pretty much um, they will set a default end lock time for transactions to the current or um, the next block, I forget, to guarantee um, at least incentive wise that things um, don't get too screwy in the event of reorgs, like a transaction can't be included in previous blocks from when it was originally mined. And they have changed um, some defaults for the IRC messaging server that it uses to coordinate uh, makers and takers. Um, but, you know, if you really want to dive through all the, the little details, uh, the release notes are in the show notes. And, um, yeah, get your privacy going, guys. Mix those outputs. All right. I almost just hit the wrong talk button again. Uh, yeah. So are we ready to hear Shinobi get angry? Uh-oh. I hope you got your shots ready, guys. So the Opera browser, which I will remind everybody, um, we covered when this investment was first made, um, they are heavily invested in by Bitmain. So this browser and the company that makes it, Bitmain is a shareholder. Um, and a while ago, they integrated a cryptocurrency wallet directly into their browser um, with Bitcoin, ETH, and a few other shitcoin support. 
Um, but now they have partnered with Sendwire uh, to integrate fiat into their crypto wallet so that people can use um, just the native wallet in the browser linked to a debit card on Android or Apple Pay on iOS um, to purchase up to $250 in any crypto that they're connected to a day. Um, their fees, 30 cents plus 2.9%. Uh, it's about any payment processor's fee. But this is, again, I will remind you, a company that Bitmain is heavily invested in that is tying crypto payments deeply into a browser. And this company is, again, one of the biggest things they're, they're doing um, in terms of services to, to kind of build off of the browser as a base is a personalized news feed powered by AI that will craft the news feed based on your interests and online behavior. This is the exact fucking opposite way that we should be baking Bitcoin into things deeply tied together, connected to fiat, correlated with all of your online traffic. This is the exact wrong way because I like this is a web browser. Those are very complicated machines or pieces of software. And there have been numerous incidences of all kinds of screwy ways that directly integrating crypto into web browsers has caused privacy compromises. Just managing your browser improperly during payments will leave cookies tying your browser, your identity to specific crypto payments at different merchants that are just sitting there in your browser that can get scooped up by somebody else, compromised and stolen. And that is all information that can be used to tie together your online activity to your financial activity and compromise your privacy. This is the absolute wrong fucking way people should be trying to bake Bitcoin into the internet. Oh, wow. There was no F words in that. All right. No shots, guys. <laughs> I was expecting like a, a, a swear storm. But uh, yeah, all right. But yeah, the, the, you should not use this browser. You should not use this wallet. You should look really long and hard at who their investors are and what their overall business plan is. If you care at all about your privacy, stay well away from this. All right. Uh, yeah, there's a. Uh... There's a couple more here that uh, I guess we should uh, get through. I'm just like, I'm, it's so hard not to watch news. I'm like, I'm like reading news stories, like had one of those chill down the back of my spine moments. I'll talk about it in the final thoughts. So uh, mm -hmm. what's going on with Coinbase Legal? Jenny. Oh, sorry. Chat was not selected. Um, so yeah, speaking of uh, companies that you should stay far, far away from, uh, it was announced by the office of the... I have never seen this word. I don't know what it means. Comptroller. Does anyone actually know what that is? It's supposed to be controller. They spelled yeah, it as comp. Comptroller is like uh, just a, a political position for somebody that does handle certain licensing. Right, Sheena? You would yeah, probably... it's, it's pretty much a management position in uh, accounting and financial reporting. Alrighty. Well, the office of the comptroller uh, of the currency... Uh, otherwise known as OCC, announced on March 16th that Brian Brooks will become its next chief operating officer and first deputy comptroller, effective April 1st, 2020. So basically, you know, less than two weeks away. Um, the appointment of this position was made by the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Mnuchin, so pretty uh, high up position. And uh, they say, Mr. Brooks joins the OCC from Coinbase, Inc., where he has served as chief legal officer since September 2018. He previously served as executive vice president, general counsel, and corporate secretary of Fannie Mae. Ooh, look at that list of uh, priors. Uh, Mr. Brooks also served as a member of the senior executive team of One West Bank um, from 2011 to 2014. He will step down from the board of directors of Fannie Mae, where he served since March 2019, and Avant, where he has served since 2017 prior to joining OCC. So yeah, it looks like a uh, Coinbase lawyer has uh, gone gone up in the world. 
like well, that revolving there. door is turning. Yeah. I, I did find it particularly funny that he's also from Fannie Mae, considering the timing of, you know, all of this and the uh, flashbacks to the uh, last financial crisis. Good lord, this is such a shitstorm that they're just like, yeah, you know what? That real big shitcoin exchange that's just like totally operating like a bucket shop. Let's bring those guys over here. We need those guys. Mm-hmm. All right, so I guess uh, I'll just jump into the last one. Um, so Blockware Solutions um, has published an in-depth uh, analysis of kind of the, the mining aspect of the network uh, three days ago. That link is going to be in the show notes. And you want to go hear uh, Marty and Matt at uh, Tales from the Crypt dove through this in their last episode, I think, too. But I'm mostly just going to kind of go through a few key points and then take a higher level look at things. But they pretty much break down the entire network into layers based ultimately on the electricity rate and look at an analysis of different types of mining equipment um, from different generations and those different electricity rates and kind of running through, um, you know, different break even and or different break even prices as well as like profitability points depending on electricity rate and the actual hardware you're using. And we are really smashing down into the red for a lot of electricity ranges and a lot of different older types of equipment. And we can see that, you know, looking at the the hash rate and especially if that holds through a few difficulty adjustment periods, we've lost something like a third of the network hash rate um, as of the last time I looked at things. And, you know, really there's just a lot of different factors that are going to get involved in this over the next six months or so and how that really settles out. Um, obviously, Bitcoin price is the chief importance there. But also, electricity prices are going to be very important as well as manufacturing capacity for ASICs. Because depending on how long we stay in a price rut, um, you know, that older equipment is is not really going to be viable to look at. And it is going to become much more necessary to get more modern, um, high-end equipment to actually stay viable without, you know, things flipping around and us starting to go off on a, on a bull run again. And it's specifically that manufacturing capacity and where geographically that is happening, I think, that is going to start to get important. Like right now, um, and I think while we're in the heat of this pandemic, uh, for the most part, the mining aspect of Bitcoin is going to be the last fucking thing on most governments' minds. But when things start settling down on the other side of this, there are going to be jurisdictions with a lot of hash rate that they could fuck with or seize or use if they decide that's a a thing they want to do at the other end of this. And so this is going to become a really geopolitically important thing going through this and getting to the other side of that. How manufacturing capacity lands on the other side of this, what energy rates are going to look like with huge changes in energy consumption globally. Like this this is going to be I think a a big reshuffling of the deck as far as the mining landscape in this space and it could really go any number of ways yeah it's really really hard to game out this whole situation and how exactly we go and and where we go and uh mining has always been a hard thing to game out and um for sure there's going to be some areas of this globe that are going to be okay and they're going to be having, you know, uh, good amounts of electricity, and then there's going to be large swaths of this world that are not going to be thinking about that in the least. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, like, this is in the long term a time to really start thinking um, about the tenability of the network in the long term if we just keep going with the types of hash rate concentrations that we have now in places like China.
like the the redistribution and smoothing of that has to start happening fast on the other side of this or that could start having really serious implications for the network and just how users interact with that like i'm not particularly worried about bitcoin getting killed if some situation like that happens but that will get really screwy in terms of can we really count this payment as finalized or consequences for how people have to interact with different layers or services like that could lead to a very disruptive period if the Chinese government gets its shit together and then decides they want to start fucking with Bitcoin because, hey, we have a fuck ton of the hash rate in the country and we've just rolled out the most totalitarian surveillance system that exists on this planet. Scary, man. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go into uh, my final thought. I mean, unless you got something else to say on it. No, nah, we, we can slide along. All right. So, uh, yeah, like I was reading, uh, you know, when we do these shows, I got Twitter up and, you know, things crop up like crazy nowadays because of everything going on. And uh, saw this where I'm not really going to say that this is confirmed or anything. But, um, you know, we I've, I've heard that this is coming down the line, like it uh, could happen. But um, looks like maybe the uh, Supreme Court of Montana is going ahead to, and um, releasing any prisoners in that they have that they uh, because of the potential spread of the coronavirus uh, right now, there's a letter circulating on Twitter that says like the Supreme Court of Montana is issuing the judges that they should. Um, I want you to know that we appreciate that you serve at the front line of the judicial system. And of course, the decisions you have to make are a substantial impact on the jail population throughout our state because of the high risk of transmittal of COVID-19 not only to prisoners within correctional facilities, but staff and defense attorneys as well. We ask that you review your jail roster and release without bond as many prisoners as you were, you are able, especially those being held for nonviolent offenses. You know, like uh, that and along with the, uh, with like I've heard that, you know, police aren't going to be responding to a lot of different um, calls now. They're only going to be responding to specific calls and a lot of police aren't going to be available. A lot of Prisoner, prisoners are going to be getting released, uh, and uh, there's just a, so much uncertainty in the air, and, um, you know, there's a lot of fear and people wondering, like, what to do, and people run into Amazon to buy stuff and everything, but in this moment, uh, let's see, uh, Caitlin Long just tweeted out this morning, uh, everyone, please just stay home. Virus has hit my family, relative in ICO, ICU with pneumonia just tested positive. He sought tests last week but turned away because not enough symptoms then. I wasn't exposed, but it just hit home. You just don't know who's infected. And if you are, so please stay home. And uh, so Caitlin Long has her family member uh, diagnosed positive. And uh, that's not necessarily a, uh, a, a death sentence, but I mean, it's something that you don't want to risk. And uh, there's a lot of people out there, you know, we care about and like, um, let's just be uh, thinking about each other and how to take care of one another in this moment. There's a lot. Uh, yeah, I'm just, there's it's a lot to be afraid of out there right now. I wish I could say something that just is like, here's how to deal with fear. Um, I think the best way would be to focus on the ones that uh, you love and you care about. And uh, then you can kind of just uh, peer through the fear. Like, don't look, uh, don't let it, don't let it paralyze you keep moving and do things that are going to be effective for you and the loved ones around you and uh we're gonna get through this mm -hmm. and, you know one thing i do want to say um this is specifically directed towards americans i'm sure that there are a lot of people listening to this in the united states who are very happy that they are gun owners and that they are capable of protecting themselves if things get hairy around them. If you are not somebody who has owned a gun before, if you are not somebody who has had experience handling and firing a gun before, please think twice before you run out and try to get your hands on a gun. 
because I am just going to put this very bluntly. Somebody with a gun who does not know how to handle it and does not know what they are doing is just going to be a danger to other people around them. If you do not know how to handle something that is a weapon, do not run out and expect you're just going to magically figure it out because you have it now. You won't. And that is a dangerous tool. Yeah, sorry to turn it so seriously sideways at this final thoughts, but this is a hard, heavy time right now. Mm. So uh, my final thought fits perfectly with Rick's because there is also a petition right now for Julian Assange to be released from prison in the UK. Um, there's a petition at change.org. I can also add that to the show notes, but um, I'm just going to read the page. Um, they say, as a vulnerable prisoner whose health is already in jeopardy, further isolation would, would be damaging in itself, let alone the threat that the virus breaks outside or breaks out inside the prison. The increased health risk means he should be released immediately. There is a high possibility that the prisons will cancel all visits, which means even harder access to his family, friends, and lawyers. Releasing him and other vulnerable prisoners would, do, yeah, would reduce the risk of outbreak of the virus inside the prison. Julian Assange should be with his family during this time where he can prepare his defense against his extradition hearing. Um, so yeah, if you want to sign that, I think, I don't know what the threshold is for signatures that they're looking for, but it has over 7,000 already, and I think at least for the first threshold, they need 7,500, so go and sign that. I don't think there's, I don't think there's a geographical consideration on it, but obviously people in the UK should sign it because their opinion matters more to their jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Right on. Let's get him out for sure. That's, that should have been happening beforehand, but for certainly in this situation. I mean, you know, I, I, I agree with this. I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, what do you do? And, you know, the prisoner population and the prison and all that, it's uh, as we go through the self-isolation, we'll start to realize more and more that was an inhumane thing to do to people anyway. Mm hmm. But, you know, on that note, you know, I guess we will catch you later, punks. Be safe and use your head. Sending later, VR everyone. hugs. <laughs> Sending VR hugs to Giacomo and Mir. <laughs> mm hmm. <laughs> Later, everyone. <laughs>